morning, Victory Church. You happen to be here this morning? Woo. Uh, we want to welcome everyone that's gathered in person. We want to take a moment, recognize uh, all of our friends and family watching online. Can we, can we just show them some love? Let's put our hands together for online community. Thank you for tuning in. On the way in, you should have received a, uh, a program uh, like this. Pastor Chris mentioned it. Uh, on the inside, I, I want to draw your attention for the last time uh, is our Easter, our Easter guide, uh, which is this. And I've got a bunch of stuff falling off out of it. You probably do too. And um, so this happens to everybody. So check around your seat. If you've got little round stickers that look like this, uh, they, they fell out. But your, your Easter guide, we want everyone to make sure that you read through it uh, this week uh, because we're challenging each other to do three things leading up to what is the greatest weekend uh, of the year, Easter Sunday. Um, we're challenging each other to do, two, to do three things, and that is to pray, to invite, and to give. Beginning tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., we're going to gather Monday through Friday in this room, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for Easter weekend. We're going to pray for people that are far from God. We're going to pray for your fa family members, your friends, your coworkers who don't know Jesus yet. Because we believe that on Easter Sunday, not only are we going to have a great celebration as we worship Jesus, but we're going to celebrate many, many people coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen. And so we want you to come out and, and be a part of, of church-wide prayer this week. And you don't have to come out every night, but choose a night. Choose a night where you commit to joining your church family and praying for Easter weekend. Monday through Friday, we'll be gathering in this room at 6 p.m., and then we want you to invite. We want you to invite that unchurched friend, family member, co-worker in your program guide. There are invitations that look like this. We want you to use it this week. There are more out in the lobby for you to grab uh, a handful to be able to hand out to people. Uh, we're, we're not wanting, uh, we, we don't want you to invite people that are already church that already know Jesus. We want you to bring people that don't yet know Jesus because they're going to meet Jesus. Amen. We've got digital copies of this available as well that you can use for social media. And then finally, we're challenging each other to give. On Easter Sunday morning, like we've been doing the last number of years, we've been bringing together a kingdom builder offering called One Day, One Day Offering. And that One Day Offering, what we're challenging each other to do is to take, uh, to take a day where you say, this day, I'm working this day, and I'm giving one day's wage to help fight global hunger. That one day kingdom builder offering is going to help us to fund, and in some cases fully fund, kingdom builder initiatives that help fight hunger either globally or locally. And so we want to bring that offering together on Easter Sunday. This is a sticker that uh, my wife and I wore this last week because last Sunday was the day that we chose. We said today is the day that we're working and we're giving one day's wage. We're bringing in on Easter Sunday together and it's going to be wonderful. And so we encourage you to be a part of that. We want to give you a, a very quick window into one of those uh, ministries locally that help to feed people. And so uh, if uh, Kevin and Mandy Diaz can join me on the stage, let's welcome them as they share a little bit about our food pantry here at Victory Church. Welcome, guys. Good morning, church family. Well, Kevin and I have the wonderful opportunity to work with the most amazing team, our food pantry right. team. So we just want to thank you each personally. We truly couldn't do it without each and every one of you, whether you're serving um, on a Saturday or packing the bags on a Tuesday. Um, they meet the community needs physically and spiritually, and we're just so grateful for each of them. So last year, we were able to give over a thousand food boxes to Come bless on. families with. That's awesome. And that included our Thanksgiving um, first time we did the Thanksgiving drive, which was close to 240 families, wow. and they received everything from the breakfast to the dessert. Come on. So we just want to personally thank you for giving financially to Kingdom Builders. Um, we are truly grateful, and if you want to sign up, you could go online. Uh, we have a great time serving our community. So, so second Saturday of every month, yes. we meet uh, in the back of our property here. Cars come if you want to. If someone wants to serve, just show up the second Saturday 
of any month, 7.30, 7.30, bright and early. There are cars already lined up, mm -hmm. and we'll have an opportunity to give people a hope, really, to give them a meal, some food, uh, but also have an opportunity to pray with people. And uh, Kevin and Mandy, thank you so much. Thank you for, for being the kind of leaders that you are. Can we give another hand to Mandy? Kevin Diaz, thank you. And so our Kingdom Builder Dollars, our one-day offering is uh, we're, we're going to, we want to, we want to really do the best that we can to fully fund global and local Kingdom Builder initiatives that help fight hunger. Thank you again for your generosity and for participating in our Easter weekend. Um, and so we're excited. Amen. All right. Well, listen, I'm ready to jump right into the word today. We're, um, we're continuing a series uh, that we started a few weeks ago titled The Ultimate Yes, The Ultimate Yes. We are uh, in the year of yes. Uh, we really felt like going into this new year that this would be the year of yes, that it would be the, the year that we give God our yes in whatever it is that he asks of us uh, because, because ultimately Jesus gave his yes. Amen. God gave his big yes to us. And so we want to be a people that say yes to God. Quick obedience, amen. And so this series, uh, the, the ultimate yes, we've been looking at the, uh, the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Really, I could take months and months and, and unpack, try to unpack the last week of Jesus. There's so much that happened during that last week. And so we're going to look at one uh, specific thing today that I think is very, very important and uh, probably the, 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 the pinnacle uh, of that week we're going to be looking at today. And so if you've got your Bibles, turn to two places this morning. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, Luke 22, and then put a bookmark in Exodus 12, Exodus 12. If you're using a paper Bible, turn to Luke 22. Luke is one of four Gospels. Um, it's the third book in the New Testament. So if you open up your Bibles towards the middle, make some right turns, You'll see Matthew, Mark, and then there's Luke. We're going to look at Luke 22 and then put a bookmark in Exodus 12. Exodus is the second book in your Bible, so go all the way to the beginning and uh, just make a couple of right turns. You'll find Exodus. We're going to look at chapter 12. If you were with us last week and you've got your notes handy from last week, uh, you'll notice that we're turning to the same two places uh, today that I asked you to turn to last week, but we're going to be looking at something different different today. Last week we talked about the four cups and the four I will statements that Jewish people celebrate, that God said I will to the Jewish people, really to us, to the world. Uh, but today we're going to be looking at something different. Uh, if you look at the, uh, if you take all of the chapters of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's 89 chapters in total in those four gospels, 89 chapters. Four of those chapters cover the first 30 years of Jesus' life, and then 85 chapters cover the last three and a half years of Jesus' life. Out of those 85 chapters that cover the last three and a half years of his life, 29 of those chapters cover the last week. There was lots that happened during the last week of Jesus. On Friday night, Shabbat, on the Sabbath and Saturday during the day, he spent some time in Bethany. It's a town very close, um, just right behind uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, just east of Jerusalem. Uh, he spent some time with friends like Lazarus and Mary and Martha uh, in their home for Shabbat. On Sunday, he came to Jerusalem. It was actually the Hebrew calendar. It was the 10th day of Nisan, not the car, the month, the 10th day of Nisan. And that's whenever uh, he walked in. We call it the triumphal entry. It's, in fact, that's what the church celebrates today, which we call Palm Sunday. The reason it's called Palm Sunday is because whenever he walked into Jerusalem, there were people that the crowds began celebrating him as he came in riding on a donkey. He, they were ra waving palm branches before the Lord and throwing them on the ground and taking off their jackets and their tunics and throwing them on the ground. And they were welcoming Jesus. This happened to be the 10th day of Nisan. What's significant about that day? That was the day when Jewish people chose their lamb that would be the sacrificial lamb for Passover. And so when Jesus came into Jerusalem on that day, on the 10th day of Nisan, Israel chose him as they 
celebrated him as the lamb that would be the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. They didn't know it at the time, but that's what really was happening. And so lots happened during that last week. On, on Monday, the next day, is whenever uh, you see one of the times that he cleanses the temple because of the extortion and, and, and all of the just crazy, um, uh, just criminal activity that was happening there. When people should have been worshiping, uh, there were people getting taken advantage of. And Jesus cleanses the temple, turns over the money changers' tables and all of that. And on Tuesday... Uh, he was at the temple. He, he taught a lot on that day. Uh, if you ever uh, heard the story of the widow's might, Jesus shared a story. Uh, and, and so he preached that on, on that on that Tuesday, on Wednesday. Uh, it's amazing that uh, you would think that on the last week of Jesus' life on earth, uh, that he would be so busy that he wouldn't have time with people. In fact, that week he would had he would have dinner with Zacchaeus, the wee little man that climbed the sycamore tree to get a better view of Jesus. He would have dinner with him, that tax collector. He would have dinner at Simon the leper's house. Uh, it just it says so much about our Jesus. You know, sometimes we feel like there's so many problems around the world that Jesus doesn't have time to care about my needs or the things that are really worrying me. I'm here to tell you that yeah, there are many things happening around the world, but Jesus cares about you. Jesus. Jesus is into you. Jesus wants to work in your life. Amen. And so uh, just like he came this morning, he's still here. And so, uh, so many things happened on, on Thursday evening was the Passover Seder. In fact, that's what we're going to read in Luke chapter 22 as they begin to prepare uh, for the Passover. In Luke chapter 22, verse 15, Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, Luke 22 and all the other gospel writers, uh, they talk about this moment. What we're reading right now is what we, we commonly refer to, this is the Last Supper. Uh, this is the Last Supper. Every month, the first Sunday of every month, we participate in what we call communion. Some call it Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. Uh, depending on your background, you might refer to it as the Eucharist. And so every month, we commemorate this meal that we're, that we're reading about right here. And what the church calls the Last Supper was actually a Passover meal. Jesus refers to it as such. He says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It's called a Seder. A Seder is, is the meal, um, and there's a number of them throughout the week, but this one was significant. And Jesus is saying, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover Seder meal with you before I suffer. Verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds, and look at that word, until it finds what? Say it again fulfillment. Jesus is looking at good Jewish boys who for all of their life, since they were little kids, were celebrating one of seven parties, three major ones, this being one of the three major parties that they would celebrate in Jerusalem every year. These good Jewish boys, they knew the Passover. They, they grew up in homes where mom and dad would put on this Seder meal. And, and what would happen during this moment with, with the Passover would, would commemorate and celebrate. In fact, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 26 and 27, uh, God tells Moses, hey, they're going to be people that are going to, they're not going to have a clue as to what I did whenever I brought Israel out of Egypt. They're not going to know about the 10 plagues. They're not going to know about Moses and about Pharaoh. They're, they're not going to know about, about that death angel that I sent to kill the firstborn in Egypt and uh, among the, the people of Israel. They're not going to know that, that event that happened. And so, and so in Exodus 12, 26 and 27, that's where I had you bookmark. If you look at that, it says, when children ask, what does this ceremony mean to you? Tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Egyptians. So these Jewish guys hanging around Jesus, they celebrated this moment with their parents as they learned the story of the Exodus. And so Jesus is coming to them on this Passover 
And he's saying to them, for 1,400 years, you've commemorated this moment in history. Arguably, the most, um, the most significant redemptive moment in the history of the world up to this point. In fact, there is, there, is no, there is no greater moment that is celebrated with such reverence as the most significant moment within the Jewish people as Passover. There's no greater leader in a Jewish person's mind than that of Moses, the deliverer. And yet Jesus is looking at his disciples and he's saying, he's saying, for 1,400 years you've commemorated this moment, you've remembered this moment, you've celebrated this moment. He says, get ready guys, what, what I did 1,400 years ago is getting ready to be fulfilled. I am going to fully fill what you've been commemorating for 1,400 years this week. That's what Jesus is saying to them. And so what I'd like to do today is I'd like, to, I'd like to, to look at and draw parallels and comparisons to, to the central figure of the Passover, and, and I want to draw parallels to the person of Jesus. To those of us who are followers of Jesus in the room, it'll be an opportunity for us to just, for us to just be more thankful and to be more grateful for all that Jesus has done for us. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, it's an opportunity for you to see the Son of God, Jesus, maybe with fresh new eyes. And before we leave today, make the decision to follow Him because He loves you so much. Amen? And so let's look at a few things here uh, Jesus is the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says that Christ is our Passover lamb. He has been sacrificed for us. So in the Passover, in the book of Exodus, there was a death angel that was sent to kill the firstborn of every family, including livestock and animals. God looks at Israel and he says, if you want to be saved from judgment, if you, if you want to be spared, you and your family and your homes, then you must do this. You must take a lamb, and that lamb must be special, it must be unique, and we'll see that in just a moment. You must take that lamb, you must sacrifice it, you must bring it in your home. The blood of that lamb you're to put on the doorpost and the lentil of your house. You must take that lamb inside of your home. You and your family must cook that lamb after you slaughter it, and you must partake of that lamb. You must eat it. And while you're in your homes having this meal, the death angel would be going by, and any house where he sees the blood of the lamb applied, he will pass over that home. That's where the word Passover comes from, because the death angel would pass over. And so what I'm submitting to you today, in fact, what the Bible just said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 is that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Let's look at what that means to us today. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, that this is the month of Nisan. Remember what the 10th day of Nisan is. It's what we celebrate Palm Sunday. This is the day they choose the lamb. This is what it says. Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one lamb for the household. Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one lamb for the household. Here's the first thought I want to give you about the Passover lamb. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write it down. Everyone needed a lamb. Everyone needed a lamb. To be included in this plan of redemption, to be part of the liberation, the great emancipation of not just slavery to Egypt, but of death itself. If you wanted to be included in this great act of redemption, then you needed a lamb. Not one person was exempt. It's not like there was any person, this was everybody, Jew and Egyptian alike. 
if, if you wanted to be a part of this great work of redemption and liberation, then every family, every household needed a lamb for themselves. There was not one person that could be exempt. There wasn't, there wasn't, there wasn't a guy by the, you know, there, there was no such thing as a guy named Holy Joe who was so holy and so righteous that he, that he was exempt from this. That whenever the death angel passed over and didn't see the blood applied, he looked into that home and saw Holy Joe and said, wow, Joe, you're so holy, you're good. No, everyone needed a lamb. Everyone needed a lamb for themselves to escape judgment, to escape death, because death was coming to everyone. It reminds me what the Bible says in the New Testament. That it is accounted for every person to die once and then to face judgment. If there's anything true about every person in this room and every person watching, whether it's online or television, if there's anything true about each and every one of us is that death will come to us at some point in our lives. But I want to submit to you that what was true then is true today. Everyone needs a lamb. Your marriages need a lamb. You, sir, need a lamb. You, ma'am, you need a lamb. Our households and our homes, our regions and our communities, we need a lamb. Why? Because none of us can claim to be good enough or religious enough or wonderful enough to not need a lamb. We need a lamb. Everyone does. Why? Because the Bible says in Psalms 14, 3, that there is no one who does good. No, not one. And that includes you. Well, I'm a good person. Haven't killed anybody. Haven't done anything wrong for the most part. And yet none of us have done good. No, not one. Each and every one of us need a lamb. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, of God's standard of perfection. Not one of us is good enough to claim exemption from needing a lamb. God said each man, each household, each family, they need a lamb for themselves. Jesus said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes, believes in him should not what? Should not perish. Should not die. The death angel is coming to every home, to every house, to every person. And I'm telling you today that you need a lamb, and you need the blood of the lamb, and you need to partake of the lamb. Jesus came as the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Why? So that you would not perish, but so that you would have everlasting life. The next verse goes on to say that God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that through him we might be saved. Why didn't Jesus come to condemn sinners? He didn't come to condemn sinners because we were condemned already, our own sin condemned us and judged us to a hell not created for us but thanks be to God that he sent a lamb our Passover lamb I'm here to tell you that you need Jesus more than you think you do you need Jesus I need Jesus our homes and our families and our children and our children's children we need Jesus no no one is exempt from needing a lamb God has one plan for redemption and that plan is a lamb Let me be clear. You can't have freedom. You can't have deliverance. You can't have emancipation. You can't have forgiveness of sin. You can't have deliverance from demons and anxiety and torment unless you receive Jesus. Jesus is the lamb that you need. Somebody give him thanks for just a moment. Everyone needed a lamb just like everyone today needs Jesus. Number two. The lamb was perfect. This wasn't just any lamb. Not any lamb would do. No, this lamb had to be perfect. And Exodus 12 verse 5 says, your lamb is to be without blemish. Without blemish. 
In other words, it had to be a perfect lamb without blemish, without any, um, without any injury. Its coat had to be perfect. It couldn't, it couldn't be striped. It couldn't be off color. Uh, it didn't matter how, how, how cute you thought your pet lamb was. If one leg was shorter than the other one, it did not qualify. Not any lamb would do. This lamb had to be unique. It had to be one of a kind. It had to be, it had to be blemish free. If, if your lamb was, was, was brown all the way around but then had a little white spot here on the forehead and you thought it was just the cutest thing since ever, it, 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 it did not qualify because this lamb had to be without defect, without blemish. Why is that significant? The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but no, verse 19, you were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In other words, like the Passover lamb that was supposed to be blemish free, Jesus is the lamb of God and he had no blemish. What did that mean for Jesus? Does that that mean that Jesus didn't have any calluses or any warts or any freckles or anything off in his body? No. What it simply meant about Jesus is that Jesus was sinless. He had no sin. He wasn't imperfect. He was perfect. He kept the law of God fully. He was sinless. Why is that important? It's because a sinner cannot save a sinner. Somebody with blemishes can't help somebody else with blemishes. Someone who's imperfect can't help somebody who is imperfect. No, we're in the same boat. It takes a sinless person to help a sinner. It takes a perfect person, a perfect savior to help someone that's imperfect. How does that work? Well, for the Passover lamb, if I'd take you back a few thousand years ago, and we would, we would living in, those, in that time where the temple was there, and we would go to Jerusalem every year to celebrate the Passover, we would, we would come and, and, and bring, and, and bring, and we would, I, I'm dad, and so I'm carrying, I'm carrying little Harry, our pet lamb. And I've got Harry on, on my shoulder, and I'm bringing Harry to Jerusalem, and we're going together as a family, and, and cute little Harry, Something bad is going to happen to Harry, but it's insignificant. And, and, this, and this cute little pet lamb, chosen on the tenth day of Nisan, perfect, without blemish, and it was important that it was, represented a lamb that would come 1,400 years later in Jesus. And the reason that lamb needed to be without blemish and without imperfections is because when I would bring that lamb to Jerusalem and I would present it to the priest, and before the priest would slaughter it there before me, I would take my hands and I would place it on the lamb, signifying that everything wrong about me, all of my sin, all of my guilt, all of my shame, for me and my entire family, I am taking all of that for this past year and I'm placing it on this lamb. And so there was a a transfer occurring. I'm taking all of my guilt, all of my shame, and I'm placing it on this perfect, sinless, blemish-free lamb. But not only was the transfer this way, there was a transfer happening this way. That that pure, spotless, blemish-free, sinless lamb, that his perfection, his sinlessness was being applied to my life. Do you see the parallel? I'm telling you that when you lay your hands on Jesus, when you lay your hands on Jesus, what can wash away my sin? I'll tell you what can. Nothing but the Lamb of God, the blood of Jesus. When I come to Jesus, He takes on my sin, my guilt, my shame, but He doesn't leave me empty. No, I receive His goodness, His righteousness, His love is applied on my life, and I become something that I couldn't become in and of myself. Why? Because of the Lamb of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is an amazing, mind-blowing scripture that says that God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, no blemish. He made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us. How did that happen through that exchange? When I lay a, a hold of Jesus, 
When they laid a hold of Jesus and crucified him on that cross, he became sin who knew no sin. He became sin. And in becoming sin, he died on a criminal's cross, taking on the wrath of God that was reserved for me. He took it upon himself. But look, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody ought to give him thanks for, for that amazing miracle that's available. It's available today to you and I. Such a powerful thing. The lamb was perfect. Number three, another parallel is that the lamb was sacrificed. The lamb was sacrificed. Exodus 12, 6 says, you must watch over it until the 14th day of the same month. So you choose it on the 10th day. Choose it on the 10th. 10th day of Nisan. That's when you choose the lamb. Jesus was chosen on Palm Sunday. They chose him. And for four days, he didn't leave Jerusalem. He was there. He would go up. Uh, just right outside of the eastern gate to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is elevated just a little bit higher than Jerusalem. And so, from, I mean, he was there. He could see he was there in Jerusalem. And so for four days, he was being watched. And the Bible says, you must watch over it until the 14th day of the same month. Why? What happens on the 14th day of Nisan? Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to slaughter the lamb. To slaughter the lamb. And, and, and I think the word that is used there is a lot more realistic than, than, the, um, than, than the sanitized word of just sacrifice. Because when we talk about the lamb was sacrificed, I mean, we just, in, in our 21st century American minds, we just, we can't see it. We don't get it. But Jesus, the lamb of God, listen to me, he was slaughtered. It amazes me that out of every moment in human history, God would choose the moment where capital punishment was the most brutal out of any time in history. The most inhumane, the most barbaric capital punishment was developed by, 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 by Rome, by the Romans, and, and how they meted out capital punishment. If Jesus would have been around today, he may have gotten a lethal injection real quick, done and over with, you know, we've got to be humane about this, but not then. God chose for his lamb to be introduced into the world during the, one of the most darkest moments in human history. And so Jesus came... And Isaiah the prophet, hundreds of years before Jesus, he would see this slaughter. God would give him a prophetic picture. Isaiah the prophet would see a prophetic picture of this Passover lamb being slaughtered. And what Isaiah saw, he would write down and we would read when he said in Isaiah 53, 5, that he saw this Passover lamb and this one was pierced for our transgression. He was pierced, not for any wrongdoing that he had done, no, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. What Isaiah is describing here, friends, is a slaughter, and it also happens to be the ultimate yes that God gave to a lost and dying world. When he gave his son Jesus, he said yes to you and me, sinners separated from him, but through Jesus, he said yes to you and to me. Somebody ought to give him thanks for just a moment. Look at that wording. He was pierced. He was crushed. He was punished. He was wounded. It all began on what we would call that Thursday evening, but for the Jewish people, it would have been, it would have been the beginning of Friday, sundown, where he would be arrested he would be arrested and he would, and, and he would go back and forth from, from the high priest to, to, uh, to, to, to Rome and to the soldiers. And, 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 and once, once the night grew dark and dark and dark, and after he was betrayed, one of the first things that they began doing to Jesus is they began beating him and giving him 39 lashes, the Bible calls it. Remember, Roman capital punishment was cruel. 
he would receive 39 lashes. Why not 40? Because people wouldn't survive more than 39. And Jesus took all 39 of them. And that lash happened from, from a, a, a leather whip that was a stranded leather cord with bits of bone and glass on the end of, of, of each strand of that whip and 39 of those lashes on his back. They would do 13 lashes on this shoulder so that they can completely tear apart the trapezius muscle right here in the shoulder so that it would disl- there would be no muscle to hold his shoulder and keep it attached to his torso. 13 on this shoulder and then 13 on this shoulder as, 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 as that whip would tear into the flesh and the muscle. And every time they would pull it back, it would just rip muscle and tissue away. 13 on each shoulder and then 13 down the spine to the degree where it would reveal the actual spine in the back. This was just the beginning of sorrow. After this, they would, he would be taken to the praetorium, which is basically the locker room for the Roman soldiers. And there the Bible says they would beat him. They would spit on him. They would punch him. They would blindfold him, smack him, and then say, hey, prophet, prophesy. Who smacked you? They would beguile him. They would take a, 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 a crown of thorns and, and place it on his head. And you would think that it would cause so much bloodshed. But in reality, it would cause all of the blood to just rush into the middle part of his brain to cause the worst imaginable migraine you could ever imagine and fathom. His beard was plucked from his face. He was spat upon and kicked. And then, out of all, after all of that, he was then crucified on a wooden cross. Those, those spikes would go into his wrist. We would say and think his palms, and that may maybe be a nice picture, but, but really if they were to put it in his palms because, because he was held up by just these nails. He, he wasn't, there, wasn't, there was no rope, but naked on a tree. They didn't put it in his palms because the weight of his body would rip. It, that nail would just rip right out of his hand. And so right in between these two bones, they would drive those stakes into those wrists and then put his feet together and then drive that stake, that nail right in through his feet. And there he hung on the cross with his legs slightly bent for the purpose, for the purpose of causing excruciating suffocation to the one being crucified. His whole body weight hanging on his wrists until he couldn't breathe and so he would lift himself up to take a breath only to slump back down and his lungs being crushed by the weight of his body remember he didn't have any muscles on the top of his shoulders he was emaciated and for every time that he would come up for air that ripped torn back would just rub up against that wooded cross he was slaughtered he was pierced for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities He was the perfect, sinless Lamb of God who was sacrificed, slaughtered for you and for me. This, my friend, is the ultimate yes. If you're here today or if you're watching and you've prayed a prayer that you're wanting for God to get your attention, if he's real, God, show me a sign. I'm telling you, this is your sign. God could not have spoken loud enough when he gave his son Jesus to be slaughtered for you, sir, for you, ma'am. He was sacrificed. He said, well, pastor, this is bad news. We'll come back next week. Next week is the good news. Number four, this is the last parallel I want to share with you. The lamb was shared. The lamb was shared. In the book of Exodus in verse four, it says, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share share one with their nearest neighbor. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. And today, you know, I've heard, I've heard it said from time to time, well, pastor, you pastor that big church. 
And for some people, they'll say it's just too big. I've got news for you. We're not too big. We're too small. You know, you know what's too big? Jesus is too big to not be shared. The reason, the, the reason we share Jesus with the next generation, the reason we share Jesus with our community and the region, the reason that we're, we're, we're challenging each other to be engaged, to invite someone, is, is because we're too small. And, and maybe we're not too small, but here, here, here's, here's what's the reality. Jesus is too big just for us. Jesus is too big. I need to share him with others. I need to share him with my neighbors. Why? Because he's just too good. He's just too big. He's just too awesome for, to be kept for myself. No, I want to share Jesus with the world around me. Why? Because he's too big. The lamb must be shared. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. That's what God was doing in Jesus as he died for you and I. He was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That's God's job. And he has committed to us, this is our job, the message of reconciliation. God's job is to do the saving. Our job is to do the inviting. I don't save people. You don't save people. God saves people. But I invite people. I invite people to the table where there's a lamb being served that is perfect, that has been sacrificed, and that demands to be shared. Our opportunity is we're coming up to what's really the greatest weekend of our year. It is every year, it's Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of this lamb that was slaughtered. Amen. And throughout the week, throughout the week, we'll have an opportunity to just reflect. As we're coming up to this last week of Jesus, and I encourage you just to do some reading in the Gospels and some of the things that happened during this last week. But as we get ready to step into this weekend, Easter weekend, our opportunity, and I just want to remind us in closing this morning, our opportunity is number one, to pray. To pray. To pray because we believe that every time we pray, something happens. It's impossible for us to pray and nothing happens. To pray because we believe that when we do, that God hears us. And if we believe that he hears us, then we have everything that we've asked of him. And so our opportunity is to pray. And starting tomorrow night from 6 till 7, Monday through Friday, we'll be gathering in this room. That's exactly what we'll be doing is we'll be praying. You don't have to come every night. Some of you, some of you can't. Some of you can't even come any night. But you can join us from wherever you are. From 6 to 7, you can, if you're out on business, if you're traveling and you, your heart's here, well, let your heart be here. And whatever you're doing, join your church and let's pray for this weekend. Why is it important to pray? It's important to pray because 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And that God is lowercase g God. Who's the God of this age? It's the devil. It's the devil. It's secularism. And the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And so the light of Jesus, the gospel is hidden, the Bible says. They are blinded to it. And so the reason we pray, we pray so that the blinders can be removed. And we talk to God about the person. Listen, you didn't get saved because you just woke up one morning and thought it would be a good idea. I guarantee you, somebody was praying for you. You were blinded to the gospel until someone decided to talk to God about you. And so we want to pray. And then we want to invite 
we want to invite. We first pray. We talk to God about the person before we talk to the person about God. We pray, but then we talk to the person. We invite. We, we just say, come and see. Just come. And, and the beauty of this weekend that we're coming up to is, is, is on any normal given Sunday, if you talk to a friend, unchurched friend, family member, co-worker, and you invite them to church with you, you have a 20% success rate of them saying yes on any given Sunday. 20%. Which to me, it's, it's worth it, even at that. But on Easter Sunday, that percentage quadruples. Listen to me. That same friend that on any given Sunday, you had a 20% chance that they would say yes. On Easter Sunday, you have an 84% chance that says, you know what? It's Easter. I'll go with you. 84%. You don't have to do the saving. You just have to do the inviting. And this is important. This is important. And, I, and I'll tell you exactly what will happen. When you invite them to church with you, and, you just, and don't just invite them, just, you know, but be good about it. Say, say something like, hey, I'd love for you to come to church with me on this Easter. I'll meet you in the lobby. I'll get you a cup of coffee at the cafe. Oh, they have coffee. Yeah, it's good. I'll get you a cup of coffee. And then you can sit right next to me. I'm going to the 9 o'clock service. I'm going to the 11 o'clock service. I'd love for you to be with me. And there's an 84% chance that they'll say yes. And they'll come. And Pastor Brendan and the worship team, which, which I just, I so appreciate them. I'm so thankful. Listen. The people that serve here at Victory Church, thank you for what you do. You, you don't, you see, this is the stuff you don't see. Thursday, Thursday nights, they're here and, and they're practicing and they're making sure that, 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 that they've got everything right and they're practicing the lyrics and, they're, and the musicians are, these guys aren't, these folks aren't paid. They're here because they want to be here and they love Jesus and they love God's people. And I'm so, and so when you bring your friend, you're, 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 you're going to be like, oh man, I can't wait for them. That because you love your church and you say things like man man I can't wait till they hear Pastor Brennan sing oh and, and that girl Katie she's oh this is a great oh and, and, and so and, and so you'll, you're going to be standing there and, and, and then and then you're like oh that's my pastor he's getting up and you know you, and, you're, and you're like oh I hope he I hope he preaches a good sermon today <laughs> and I'll do okay but Jesus will do amazing and we'll come to the time of the service like right now and I'll say this every head bowed and every eye closed and everybody will do it every eye will be closed except for your one eye and, and, I'm, and I'm giving you permission right now to just go ahead and keep that one eye open if they're sitting next to you and we give people an invitation and the blinders are removed and maybe for the first time or for a long time, they see Jesus and they say, I want him. They don't want religion. They don't want all the other stuff that we normally package it with. But they want Jesus. And they'll slip their hand up. And on the inside of you, you just, it's like you, you believe it, but you're amazed that God would do a miracle in your friend and your family member's life and then we'll have everyone stand and then we'll invite people to come forward and your friend, your family member, they won't walk alone. You'll be right there with them as they give their life to Jesus and you'll be celebrating on the way home and, and, and they want to talk about all the stuff and, 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 see, and see, that's what happens when we, when we get involved, when we pray and when we invite. God does the saving, we do the inviting and then lastly, and we close and we're going to pray for everyone here in just a moment. Number three is you participate participate. Now, I know we already talked about the one-day offering and all of that, and, and you thought the third one was give because it goes along with our Easter guide, and we're going to do that. But number three is participate. And by participate, here's what I mean. Not only to come ready to worship God with our gift and, and to worship God, but to come and worship God with, our, with, our, with ourselves, with, with our lives. Here's what I'm saying. Whatever level of worship you are accustomed to next Sunday be ready to just take it up a notch 
So, so if your level of worship is here and this is what you're comfortable with, you're right here. Come ready next week to just say, God, I want to give you, I want to give you this. I, I want to be here in worship. And what, what I mean by that is when you come and 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 you come and and, and this is your level of worship. And maybe, maybe this is your level of worship. You're going to come next Sunday and say, God, I, I, want, I want this to be my level of worship next Sunday. Or maybe you're already here. You're going to say, God, I want this to be my level of worship. Or maybe you already do this, but you're going to say, God, I want this to be my level of worship. Listen, I'm telling you, what, what, what am I doing? Do I just want to have an exciting church? Do I just want us to listen to everything that I'm sharing with you? I, I, don't, want anything, I, don't, want, I don't want anyone to feel guilt. Don't feel guilt about having to come to prayer. Don't feel guilt about inviting someone. Don't feel guilt about how you worship. No, listen, I, I, I don't want guilt to be the prominent emotion, but I do want there to be a sense of urgency. And my heart is not just to prepare you for next week. But my heart is to prepare you to what John the Revelator said when he said that he heard a loud voice and they were saying, who's the they? It's you. It's those of us who placed our hands on the Lamb. What were we saying? We were saying on that day when Jesus returns with a loud voice, not a quiet voice, not even an assembly of God voice or a church of God voice or a clap. No, we were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Come on, let's stand to our feet and tell Jesus how much He's worthy this morning. No hype. No hyperbole, no exaggeration, no, no emotionalism, no mind over matter. I'm preparing us so that when we see him, it would not be the first time that we used our voices loudly to say, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Honey, I'm going to ask you to join me, please. Prayer team, you can come and get ready. Jesus fulfilled Jesus fulfilled every prophetic every prophetic unction of that Passover lamb you know what I sense right now and I sense it in the first service as well there are some of you here today you can't wait till next week to give your life to Jesus you've got to do that right now you can't leave here today without receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, if that's you, you want to receive Jesus Christ today. I'm going to pray for you, but I can't unless you do me one important favor. And it's not a favor to me, it's a favor to you. Right where you're standing at right now, friend. If you want to give your life to Jesus and you want Jesus to forgive you of all of your sin, to deal with your anger and your hurt and your pain and your hatred and you want all of that completely removed and you want to be a follower of Jesus, if that's you, friend, right where you're standing at, right now, slip your hand up quickly, quickly. Don't be backward. Don't be, a f all right, come on, hands up everywhere. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see that. God bless you. Go ahead and slip your hands down. Slip your hands down. I see you. I see you. Here's, here's what we're going to do. I know you mean business with God. So right where you're at, right where you're at, right now, slip out of your seat.
meet me right here at this altar. Come on, come on quickly, sir. Young person, on the back. Come on, don't be backward, don't be ashamed. Come on, I told you we're gonna pray. Just come, come quickly. Come on! Come to Jesus. Just come. Come. <laughs> Come on, in the back. Just come. Just come. Come on, we'll wait for you. Just come. Just come. If, if you know that you should be up here right now, if you know that you should be up here right now and you, and you didn't come, but, but you wish that that chain wasn't so strong that's holding you in your seat, here's what these folks can tell you. As soon as you take that first step, that chain will snap off of you and you'll come the rest of the way. So if that's you, leave your seat now in Jesus' name and come to an altar to receive Jesus. Come on, do it quickly. Come, sir. Come, ma'am. God is speaking to you. Just come. Just come. Hallelujah. Well, guys, this is it. This is the moment where God does a miracle in your life. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to a church, denomination, or religion. You're coming to Jesus. And in just a moment, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. All you need is two things for this prayer to work in your life in this moment. Two things. Number one, you need faith. And you already have faith. How do I know? Because the Bible says that God gives us that as a gift in a moment of salvation. You would not have walked in a room this large in front of people to give your life to Jesus if you didn't have a belief that Jesus can do the miracle of saving you. That's faith. The second thing is sincerity. Make this prayer your own. So right where you're standing, hold on, Mother, just wait one second. We'll pass those out in just a minute. Thank you for for doing that. Thank you for being ready. Just hold on one second. Don't pass anything out. Just one second. Just hold on one second. Just hold on one second. I need you to listen. Hold on one second. Our friends are eager to serve you. So thankful for them. Close your eyes with me. Say this prayer. Make it your own. Say it out loud. Church family, if you can help me, help them. Say this. Say, Father God here I am today just as I am I believe that you died for me and rose again on the third day forgive me Jesus of all of my sin wash me and make me clean I want to live for you from this day forward I give my life to you Jesus now help me to follow you all the days of my life in Jesus name amen and amen thank you Jesus hallelujah hey guys today is just a preview today is just a preview here's what you're going to do this week in just a moment we've got friends or our prayer team they're going to give you a packet that looks just like this And we want you to get it. Why? Because it's going to help you this week as you take these these first steps in following Jesus. And what you're going to do is you're going to come back next Sunday. This is your next step. Your next step is to come back next Sunday, but don't come alone. Bring a friend. Bring two friends. And then you're going to walk with them as they give their life to Jesus too. Because you're not going to do this alone. You're going to do this with friends. Amen? So make sure you get one of these. They're going to serve you. And as we, and you can stay here. Don't move until you're served. We want to invite people. We're going to bless you. And at the end of this blessing, if you're here and you need prayer for any reason, 
We have people on our prayer team that want to pray for you. Keep your eyes open as we bless you. Friends and family of Victory Church, I bless you. I bless you this Passion Week to know him, to make him known, that you would encounter him in special, dynamic, in corporate and personal ways. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We'll see you on Easter Sunday or at prayer this week. God bless you. We love you. Come on, if you need prayer, just come. We want to pray for you.